Yep. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Kip Koske. I, uh, I work, uh, I'm a practitioner. I work at Bank of America covering African banks. Um, thank you for the book. Thank you for the talk. It's quite uh, insightful and quite welcoming. Um, just had a couple of comments slash questions. One to do with the uh, cost of funding. Um, in terms of uh, seeing the cost of funding, uh, it's quite draconian if you, if you place a cap on how much uh, the funding is, uh, is required. So um, an, uh, an alternative to that would be putting caps on different sectors. For example, putting a cap on the real estate sector, as you said, uh, it's quite a, a high proportion of lending that goes into that. And then secondly, goes to Victor's point on regulation and uh, uh, where we see that going, uh, going through in terms of the default rates and um, <coughs> sorry, in terms of the default rates, where do we see um, the legal transparency that comes to uh, when, when there's a default? Uh, where do we see the recoveries of the banks on those, on those defaults and how, and how that works out? And is that factored into the cost of funding as well? Okay, that's a very good uh, question. Um, gentleman over there. My name is um, Rul Jongenel, agricultural economist from the Netherlands, so a little bit outside the financial sector, but still I have a, a question. Um, and that's about the, um, the, the interest-free or, or the Islamic kind of banking. Do you see that also the default rate is lower there because you said they, are more, they have more an, a motivation to go into uh, advising on the projects because they would like to have them profitable? Which would then suggest that they could may also maybe also operate at lower lower costs. Is this a thing you have seen? Okay. Let's let's. Oh, there's uh, there's uh, Mark Mark on the left. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Boland. I'm an economist covering African Middle East for Bloomberg Intelligence. So I have a question on the uh, net interest margins. Are really two questions. I mean, to what extent? Is this due to lack of credit information preventing banks going after, going after new customers? I mean, including customers that might have had relationships with other banks. And do you see a difference when it comes to net interest margins between banks that are more focused on corporate lending, deposit taking, which I think is more the case in Nigeria and other more retail focused banks? Okay. So shall we take these um, these three three questions? They're really sort of two areas, I suppose. One is about the cost of of, of finance, and um, uh, thinking about uh, the interest rate spread uh, rather than capping it. Or first, what, what what is behind the interest rate spread? But secondly, uh, rather than capping it, shouldn't you think about a cap to uh, to lending to particular sectors? Uh, and the other question is about um, I think it's one about Islamic finance, which maybe Olu can can take, and maybe you can also answer uh, the first question as well. But Stephanie, do you like to go first? Yeah, I was maybe being a bit provocative to uh, with a sort of slightly radical proposal. I think a sort of intermediate proposal that has already been applied in Kenya <coughs> is to f fix a sort of reference rate, and banks that have higher spreads than that reference rate. I have to explain to the central bank why they're charging more. It's a sort of first step. <clears throat> Maybe it's a better way of doing it more gradual. But <clears throat> I found your idea of, of sectoral caps uh, very interesting. Um, it's, of course, difficult to implement because, as you know, money is fungible. So if you wanted to borrow for real estate, you might pretend that you're borrowing for something else and so on. But I think the idea that you would limit um, the spreads you could perhaps do it counter cyclically as well. I mean, you could say, okay, there is too much real estate lending, so one way of of limiting that lending could be to 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 control the spreads. Another is to um, just uh, have higher capital requirements, which is a similar way, which has the advantage of of, of having a you know a, a stronger buffer in the future if things go wrong. But I think. I mean, it hasn't been fashionable to think in terms of sectoral policy, uh, like on, on, on the cost of credit or, or loan-to-value ratios and so on. But I think there is a return to thinking about these things 
because they had been quite successful in countries, for example, like India, who has regulated loan-to-value ratios for, for, for real estate lending, has been quite successful on, on prudential terms, even Canada and so on. Um, and, and, and I think that the, 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 the sectoral approach, if, if, if well designed, um, but of course it will discourage lending to those sectors that you cap more. You wouldn't want to, the problem is that you may have priority sectors where you want to channel funds, let's say SMEs, and if you cap the lending and not the rest, then the, the lending will not go to SMEs. So that, that, that is a difficult thing I'd like to think about more, but thanks for the point. Okay. The question about Islamic finance. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that point. Uh, the truth of the matter actually is that Islamic banks don't impose interest rate. So, so uh, they, 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 they are actually engaged in some kind of profit sharing arrangement. Mm -hmm. So um, one needs to do a computation of equivalence. That, okay, if you, if, if, you, if you got so much, you know, from an enterprise you had supported at the end of the year, what, is, what, what, what would have been the equivalent of that if you had actually imposed a uh, lending rate and see whether it is lower or higher? I also suspect that it may be lower than, because, you know, um, since it's a proportional ar arrangement, the, 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 there's some kind of implicit discriminatory pricing regime inside, you know, Islamic banking framework, whereas in the authors, uh, you know, uh, Banks, the, the cost of credit is equal to everybody. So whether you, it, it, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't reflect your ability to pay, as it were. Whereas if you are going to be engaged in profit sharing, at the end of the year, it's whatever you get that you, you take a proportion off. So um, <coughs> the, the, the proportion don't change regardless of the quantum of money you made. So it's therefore, it's, it's in the interest of the, of, the, of the bank to ensure that you make a lot of profit so that you can have a large volume even the same proportion, uh, and if, if, if by any chance the profit uh, uh, rate or the profit level, quantum of money made is actually very small, you get a small amount of money. So that's where the interest of the bank uh, in, in under Islamic banking regime is not about uh, imposing a cost, but it's about getting you to succeed and make a lot of money so that you can get a lot of money back. So uh, we need to see uh, this kind of working out the equivalence you know, the interest rate equivalent of, you know, uh, Islamic banking regime and see whether, whether, whether we get. And then the next question is, how do they choose the sector to which they want to expose? Maybe behind their own analysis is the, the relative profitability of particular sectors before they then expose themselves to it. So if, if they, they are not likely to go into uh, 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 an enterprise that is operating in a sector that is in distress, for example. Uh, so that would be some kind of selection, you know, uh, criteria, which can crowd out many, you know, uh, enterprises, whereas under authorized banking, whoever comes through the window, uh, once it meets our requirements, we give the money, do we have collateral, do we have the records, and so on and so forth, then we give you the money. If you fail, you go and take our money back by selling your asset. Those are the kinds of uh, uh, challenges that I think um, uh, we face, you know, but, but again, research, we have to bring it out. After a number of years, we now compute interest rate equivalence and see whether it is higher than the orthodox or lower. Victor, do you want to comment? Uh, uh, thank you. Um, yes, this uh, question of uh, um, uh, sectoral caps or caps on loans um, uh, is kind of interesting uh, because it just reminds me of uh, those. Uh, linear programming models we used to do in the late 1990s, uh, whereby um, you'd pose a problem with a bank trying to manage its portfolio and maximizing the amount of loans subjects to, and then you are putting a cap, lending to agriculture, lending to industry, lending to that. And um, it, 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 it was always a challenge. And um, from those exercises, possibly I spent about five years working on this, um, to think that really, why do you have to, why couldn't you use any other methods of kind of evaluation without imposing the cap? Okay. Then um, I, I've just come back from um, um, a stint of four years at a multilateral development bank. And I had the same conversation with the governor of a central bank 
late into the night who had introduced some caps on various loans institutions. And I'm saying, no, no, this is not the way to go. Because I think that um, you could easily um, provide high quality loans that uh, may result in lower default um, uh, rates and which will be, uh, you know, sustain a highly performing um, um, uh, portfolio or loan book without actually necessarily putting on the, the, these caps. If it is a high cost, I think the, inf the question about um, um, the lack of information is right on the dot. Where uh, um, credit reference bureaus have been established in some African countries, it has gone a long way in accurate assessment uh, of information about the lending and therefore reducing the high, uh, low default uh, rates. Having said that, I know the limitations in that area. The limitations have been um, 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 collusion, where you know uh, the bank uh, officers uh, act in cahoots with the uh, with the, with, with, the, with the loan um, uh, takers, and then of course, um, but that's a straight case of embezzlement, which can be uh, investigated. Hmm. It's not always true that the courts of safeguarding um, um, uh, the credit of the loans may work. I was in Yemen in 1998 um, uh, during the transition of the two countries into one country after the war. And my role was to work on credit policy. And we put together a bank uh, uh, and a court that would look at recovering loans uh, that were, had gone bad, but which people had defaulted. And the judgments were being set, and people were being arrested. They got the police. And the police chief will come to them, oh, go, go, you'll pay the money when it comes to you. Okay. But that's actually a complete breakdown of that. But I think where there is good governance and if, uh, uh, information is available, that actually will mitigate the high default loans, uh, not necessarily the cap. Okay. I would not side with the cap. So no cap on interest rates, spread, <laughs> no cap on lending, but maybe more information. Yeah, yeah. I, sp I, I suppose, I, suppose uh, I mean, I'd also like to bring in Robert, I think uh, you had your hand up, because I think, I mean, with your experience in, in financial, uh, in, in banking, international banking, is the, the, the key question is about uh, financial intermediation uh, and how can it work better? Oh. Uh, and uh, I, I suppose, I don't know whether you have anything to say. I just well, uh, ask for permission for eight minutes uh, running over, if, if you're all right with that, so that you can wait for the reception uh, for eight minutes, and then we just have take three more questions, and then we'll, uh, we'll finalize the meeting. Thank you for that. Robert. I would like to, if I may, um, touch on the question of the, whether well, there's an optimal balance, Stephanie, between the role of foreign banks and the role of indigenous banks in these economies. I'm thinking, Stephanie, of work of a mutual acquaintance of ours, David Lubin, now of City, who stressed very strongly that foreign banks can contribute to financial stability. And of course, we've had the case of Ethiopia, where there are no foreign banks. And on the other end of the spectrum, in the developing markets, we have Mexico, Central Europe, where the foreign banks predominate. And I know there are arguments either way, but I would really just like to focus in on that, because I think there may be a balance there where foreign banks have a useful role to play whether it's in technology. But I think more importantly, I think if you don't have foreign banks, you have a tendency towards herd behavior and crowding towards specific sectors, which can lead to banking crises where, where the indigenous banks don't have differentiated lending policies, perhaps, and, and all follow the same strategies. And I think that risk is, is greatly reduced if you have foreign banks, perhaps with a greater degree of, of, of global experience so that's really my question, is whether okay. there is a, yeah. a balance to be found here between the foreign banks and, and uh, indigenous banks. Okay, the, the lady in front of you, I think, has her hand, hand up as well. My name is Amina Ado. I'm from Nigeria. My uh, a student in IDS, my question is to uh, Prof. Uh, Olu Ajakai. You talked about AMCON, and I want to hear your views on whether it's a moral hazard uh, for the banks, especially if you look after 2009, after the bailout, now we are going to face another crisis probably. How did Amcon play the, a role in getting these uh, banks to even lend more to the oil and gas sector, which even in, two, even in the past crisis constituted more than 25% of the bad loans, and now is going to be a huge uh, you know, problem uh, coming from the oil and gas sector. So how did Amcon create, uh, you know, contributed to this and what can be done? Thank okay. you. Okay, two final points. I think the gentleman over here. Oh, <laughs> three. 
Hello, my name's uh, Douglas Bennett from Granka. We guarantee local financing into infrastructure. So my question is mainly about infrastructure and sort of touches on the points the gentleman first made. <clears throat> you know, in, in the sector, especially in sub-Saharan Africa that we deal with, most of the large infrastructure is, is, is uh, funded by DFIs in dollar debt. So, I mean, and, and potentially at the uh, exclusion of the local market. So, have you looked in or are you going to look into whether the, the DFIs have actually excluded and aided to instability in the local markets rather than actually included and added to the stability in the local financial markets? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Judith, I think you had to hand up. So, how worried should we be about uh, uh, the impending credit market problems? That's over there. Um, uh, just a question really for Victor. Um, you were talking there about the cost and the default rate, and of course that, you know, it, to, to me what you were describing was a very fundamental relationship between the credit risk that's in, in the banking sector uh, being reflected in, in the risk-reward relationship. Uh, I'm wondering, is there a role where we should be looking beyond banking, and particularly the domestic banking sector, to other investors, um, and particularly equity investors, who not only look for high rewards, but bear the risk of those investments themselves? Uh, I'm thinking of private equity, but of course, uh, all those comments, in a way, what you're describing with Islamic banking is a, effectively an equity investment in terms of the uh, reward for the, for the lender uh, as well. Okay, and the final uh, gen gentleman over there. Hello, my, my name is uh, Fritz and uh, I think the, uh, the topic on the board is uh, achieving financial stability. Um, what I'm hearing is more of achieving financial stability in the financial sector. Um, there's less uh, the subtle mention of other growth factors like economic trade agreements, uh, governance, and uh, I, I don't know whether addressing the issue of financial sector goes a long way in, in enabling growth in Africa. Okay, um, so that brings us to the fi to, uh, towards the end. I'd like to sort of uh, give the opportunity to the speakers uh, to have one final remark. Just remember that you're in between, you need to balance uh, your intelligent remarks <laughs> with also making sure that we still are on time for the reception. So, <laughs> um, uh, so if you just could, could limit your comments uh, to, to a sort of one major point. Uh, and I would start with Victor, then Olu, and then Stephanie. Uh, uh, my parting shots uh, would be uh, that um, uh, I agree, uh, Judith, with the point you raised. I think we should be looking broadly at the financial services industry, um, which will go beyond the banks, uh, because otherwise we would be excluding some very critically needed sectors in development, uh, private equity and, um, and, um, and uh, venture capital and others, which are, are, are critical. I also appreciate the point made here in terms of the financing of our, our infrastructure. That's um, um, a great need, and some of the work that is discussed here from commercial banks actually are concerned with more or less you know, short-term uh, um, uh, transactions rather than the long-term developmental aspects. That, uh, uh, but those, I think, should be incorporated into the framework because they do address some of the, the bottlenecks um, uh, that would necessarily to be addressed to be able to free up the activities of the uh, banking sector. Yes, uh, yeah, let me just respond to my sister's uh, uh, question. You're right, um, Am Amcon has uh, the tendency to create some kind of moral hazard you know, uh, problem. But um, um, and, and what I'm trying to say here is that the Amcon initiative may not be viable you know, going forward because it was actually funded by government. Uh, fortunately, um, with the new government in place, a lot of the uh, loans that had been taken, and people are not actually intending to pay back, uh, government is now making effort to uh, recover at least a large part of that. So the capital base of Amcon may not be impaired, and therefore may stand ready to rescue banks when you know fiscal space in government is not there. But I think there's need for some kind of proper governance and regulatory framework that we avoid the important question of moral hazard, because once they know that somebody is there to take up the bad you know, assets from, from them, the so-called toxic assets, they can start acquiring them and then put everybody at risk. So I think that, that calls for proper governance, and that requires some kind of legal framework, which uh, has to be done in order to avoid this type of thing. Otherwise, it is, 
uh, an initiative that actually prevented a, a major collapse in the you know aftermath of financial crisis. And because the fiscal space is no longer there, but luckily they are trying to recover some of the money. Let us hope that the requirement to bail out the banks that will run into distress going forward will not be more than the amount of money that Amcon has. Otherwise, there will be a challenge for the fiscal authority going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Well, I just first uh, want to thank really you, Dirk, Victor, for his generous comments on the book, and Olu for his great contribution on Nigeria. Uh, it's been really great, and thank you, Victor, very much. Um, I thought that Robert's question is, is very central. Um, when I discussed these kind of issues with the Governor Reddy of the Reserve Bank of India, he always uses the word balance. And I think that one could apply that to your point. I think one extreme is Ethiopia with 0% foreign banks, and the other extreme is probably Czech Republic with 95% of foreign banks. And I think a, a good financial sector will have both, will have the advantage of both. For example, for the following reason, if you have a crisis that is domest has domestic reasons, say because there's a drought in the country, or there's a bad fiscal policy, uh, your domestic banks will be very vulnerable because they will be heavily exposed in, in your country. But, and your international banks can help more easily and could be even counter-cyclical because they, they are very diversified. So a drought in Ethiopia or, or a bad fiscal policy in Ghana will not necessarily affect them so much. But if the crisis is more international, the problem is that foreign banks can also bring uh, contagion because they, they are suffering, for example, in Europe, and therefore in Western Europe they bring a uh, contagion to Ukraine or to, to Central Europe. And similarly, when there's a banking crisis, sometimes in, when there was in the U.S., it affected Mexico and so on. So I think that that's why I think you have to hedge uh, by by being more diversified and by trying to play to the strength of 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 both, um, I just would like to say this issue of other other actors. I think um, it's also not just uh, foreign actors, uh, but also um, and foreign and domestic banks, but also domestic capital markets. I think one of the areas where there has not been perhaps enough development are, for example domestic corporate bond markets in, in, uh, in Africa. Um, countries like Chile, Mexico have benefited tremendously from having uh, developed these domestic capital markets, which can shield you more in times of, for example, drought of capital flows. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is an area that, that is not sufficiently uh, developed. Also, the Asian countries have done very well in developing domestic capital markets. So I think a more diversified and deeper financial sector in those senses can be very valuable. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Um, <coughs> thanks to the audience for, uh, for uh, the questions and, uh, and also the, the, the panelists for the high-quality discussions made possible by the high-quality book that mm -hmm. Stephanie has uh, co-edited with Ricardo. Uh, so I, sh I, I would really recommend uh, that you read it from, uh, from cover to cover. I did read it from cover to cover, and it's a really excellent book, uh, really important, really influential and timely, as Victor mentioned. Um, and uh, your reward is, uh, is next door. Uh, there is a reception there. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you for the, uh, for the speaker. So thanks very much. Thank you.